I have less patience for movies that leave me feeling nothing. No character to root for, no dialogue that felt like it could have been spoken by an actual human being, something that feels more like an expensive exploration of a director's self-satisfaction, or a vapid, disingenuous, empty addition to the conveyor belt of content. I just want to feel something. Entertainment, fear, disgust, laughter, worry. The feeling of someone actually pulling off a grandiose or intimate magic trick. Thankfully, this year we feel there were many movies that rose above that dreadful C-word. And we've arranged them into our own, for your enjoyment. Again, our selections are entirely subjective and might not reflect what you personally connected with the most. But let's be honest, this disclaimer was for those who have already skipped ahead of the chapters in the video and will soon be furiously writing a comment. For us at Screened, these best of videos are not a means for debate, but serve as an appreciation slash celebration of another year of storytelling, a moment of shared cinematic retrospection. A lot of good movies came out at the tail end of the year, but we didn't have time to see all of them. We did manage to come up with a list of our top 11 movies, starting with 7 honorable mentions. The first is Godzilla Minus One, a monster movie with a heart the size of its titular kaiju. I like that the monster wasn't an ally or an anti-hero, but a force of nature that was hell-bent on destroying everything in its wake, including people that were still dealing with the end of the war and were just trying to find meaning in their new lives. It also makes a good case on the choice of living over the romanticization of a patriotic death. But I have to admit, the acting at times felt like something out of a live-action anime. In any case, I'm glad it's getting the attention it deserves. Next up is Killers of the Flower Moon, a sprawling tale of deceit that really makes your blood boil. As you see Martin Scorsese purposely letting the cold actions of slaughter speak for themselves with inhuman normalcy. I felt it could have been shorter, but otherwise a poignant, well-told true crime story. And the third was a very enjoyable take on its titular character's existential crisis, Barbie. As she tries to understand where she fits in the world, it's all very heightened, colorful, and bright, but it chooses its quiet and heartfelt moments well. And it was the perfect palate cleanser after Oppenheimer. The fourth is a late entry, The Boy and the Heron, a hand-drawn technical marvel. Such close attention to recreating reality in not just what we see but hear, like something as simple as the sound of feet hitting the wooden floorboards and other less perceivable things like the sensation of fire with the heat emanating close to someone. I really like how they established the main character's loss in contrast to the fantastical world we followed the fugly heron to. It was enjoyable, but I didn't connect with it as much as other people did. The fifth entry is John Wick 4. I find it managed to build on everything its predecessors made and just keeps one-upping itself in terms of action, fights, choreography, stunts, everything, to the point where it seems excessive but it's still a very fun and entertaining watch. The sixth mention is Talk To Me, a fresh take on a viral curse that for the most part avoids a lot of the well-traveled horror movie traps. It went into some truly nasty scenes and made sure we heard and saw all of it, especially the feet stuff. And now the final honorable mention for me is Asteroid City, Wes Anderson's foray into science fiction. Although without losing any of his trademark whimsy, wit, or humor, the story within the story deals with grief and changing worldviews, and could have rated higher in our list, but I personally would have preferred if there was less of an emotional distance between the director and the audience. Now it's time to begin the top 11 with number 11. I wanted to start out with a movie I personally was surprised with how much I enjoyed and how much I kept thinking about throughout the year. Skinamarink. Dad? A movie where you don't see people's faces, it has strange low angles, it has very low light, but it succeeds in putting you in the mind of a child at night waiting for your parents to come home. And that's why I like this movie. It manages to capture that feeling that a lot of us have had of staying up late and wondering if something bad has happened to our parents. Going into the darkness and seeing something you don't understand and having no one to tell you that everything will be alright. Some people might not get it or might have never had that fear, but I remember many times looking at the back of my parents' head and thinking if it was really them. This explores those childhood fears and proves you don't need a big budget to do so. The limits are the reason why I can appreciate this movie even more. How many times have we been afraid of a dark hallway? That never needs any elaborate set blocking, special effects, or what have you. 
All this movie did was double down on the darkness and present it in its true, blurry, unperceivable, bloody form. Now out of the darkness and into the light with number 10, the bloody good time bottoms. We're gonna start with drop kicks, tackling, a little bit of knife play, then punch bucket, which is when we throw you in a bucket and we punch you until you bleed. Two self-admitted, untalented, uncool lesbians start a female fight club at school with a simple ulterior purpose, shared by most high school comedy movies, to score. Despite the flawed main character's self-interest, the club is actually serving as a means to empower its members. As the movie continues, you start getting in on the joke that this is a very heightened reality, where football players wear their uniforms at all times. Marshawn Lynch is somehow in this movie and is a very permissive club advisor. And there is an elaborate long-standing school feud that is expected to lead to a huge fight and certain death. Yet for all its exaggeration and raunchy crassness that rivals Superbad, it has heart and it's not mean-spirited at all. A high rate of jokes permitted high school coming-of-age violent fantasy. Up next, number 9 has fighting but served with a heavy helping of drama. And it was the last movie to make it on this list, The Iron Claw. People said my family was cursed. Pop tried to protect us with wrestling. He said if we were the toughest, the strongest, nothing could ever hurt us. The tragic true story of the Von Erich brothers, who were a wrestling family dynasty. Listen, you don't need to know anything about wrestling to watch this movie. I don't know anything about wrestling, but that's a testament to a good movie. It makes you care about the subject matter even if it's something you know you would have never googled. It beautifully presents their brotherhood, their unnecessary forced rivalry, and their heart-wrenching parade of sorrows. What they had to live through is honestly more than anyone's fair share of tragedy. But at the core of the story and the gem of the movie is Zac Efron. I mean, give this man an award. He gives his heart, soul, and body to this movie. There is no one in this film that looks as fit as he does and with good reason, to be able to do all those stunts. He gave a full performance. And one of his lines just broke me. Just the sheer simplicity of how he delivered it. Anyway, it really captures the loss of this family but offers some hope. This is the one that got me the most sentimental in the theater. Moving on to another sad selection. If you've ever watched Kore Eda Hirozaku's previous work, you know his films can send you on an emotional roller coaster. And number eight on our list is no different, Monster. It starts off as the story of a mother who is worried about her son's odd behavior. As she digs deeper, she believes it's because his teacher is being abusive towards him. But the story isn't that straightforward. Not everything is as it seems. As the narrative takes a Rashomon turn, we see the reality of what's going on from different characters' perspectives. The subject matter is nothing new or groundbreaking, but it's addressed with care and empathy, compelling us to ask who the real monster is. The screenplay, the acting, Ryuchi Sakamoto's final score, they all immerse us into a sad story about our misconceptions, the complexity of the truth, and the simplicity yet far-reaching consequences of lies. Number seven is the warm cup of 70s academic nostalgia, the holdovers. We really supposed to let these boys just skate by? But we can't be ignorant of politics. That boy is too dumb to pour piss out of a boot. Sometimes drama, often hilarious, due to the well-written creative insults these misfits launch at each other. This was a heartwarming story on the need for human connection, an emphasis on story. A lot of movies these days are constructed on a thin concept a few good scene ideas, or are very atmosphere dependent. But this film actually develops its characters and completes their story arcs in an organic and emotionally satisfying way. You can feel the writer's skill being exercised in the script. It even uses its own nostalgic setting as a theme for what it's trying to say about the present, about people that get stuck staring at the rearview mirror. It feels like a comfort on a Sunday afternoon, a passing intimate get-together with friends. And up next is a sequel to one of my favorite recent comfort movies. In every other universe, it doesn't end well. It's the first time for everything, right? Mm. 
Just as Miles Morales could have been one more Spider-Man among a multitude of different Spider-People, number 6 on our list could have just been one more superhero film among so many others out there. But Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse more than justifies its existence and manages to be one of the very few movies that fully utilizes the now overused multiverse type of story. The different animation styles, the varying music genres help reinforce the idea that we are dealing with characters that come from other worlds. And it's a beautiful mashup on the screen when you see all those contrasts in the same frame. What makes this movie more than just eye candy is the way it explores its main characters. They aren't just name drops or cameos, they feel like real people with relatable problems, all trying to make the right choices. It's too bad this movie is part one of two because by the end you feel amped and ready to watch the concluding chapter immediately after. Now we enter our top 5 with the surprisingly uncomfortable watch of May December. I didn't mean for it to happen, but we fell in love. So she was in denial, you would say? Oh, absolutely. We follow an actress as she researches the subject of an upcoming biopic she's about to star in, with the objective of being as truthful as possible in her portrayal. The subject in question, a woman who engaged in a sexual relationship with a 13-year-old boy. Years after being arrested and incarcerated, the woman and her victim are married and have three children and seem to be living a perfect life. At least, that's what they try to emulate. Since everybody around the couple seems to not want to talk about the elephant in the room, we get to see very subdued performances that are a lot about what is left unsaid. Reactions, looks, emotions bubbling under the surface, waiting to be let out as they each lie to themselves in order to justify their own actions. Although Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore play off each other in a great way, the standout, I feel, is Charles Melton. He plays the boy trapped in a man's body, forced to grow up and to be the side character in his own life. His performance is understated and heartbreaking. Speaking of heartbreak, up next is number 4, Past Lives. I'm not going to tell you that you can't see him or something. He's your childhood sweetheart. And it's not like you're going to run away with him. A what could have been type of doom romance story about Nora and Hai Sung, two Korean kids who grew apart after Nora's family moved away. They each lived their own lives and reconnected through the internet, until finally, after 24 years, they get to spend a few days together in New York. Celine's song borrows from her own life experience and creates a realistic and melancholy feel for the film that reminds me of Lost in Translation and her. I connected with this movie because being a child of immigrants, I found myself wondering what could have happened if my parents never came to Canada and can understand Nora's situation, finding fulfillment within a new culture while being reminded that you come from elsewhere. And even if you go back, knowing you wouldn't fit in because the place no longer represents you fully, yet you're still fond of it and love those who were left behind. It's a truly bittersweet farewell to what could have been. And now for number 3 on our list, which on paper is a very basic and down-to-earth biopic. The story of J. Robert Oppenheimer's involvement in the making of the atomic bomb and the political fallout afterwards. It's too soon to... It's too soon to determine what the results of the bombing are. But Christopher Nolan elevates the material by committing to making a story that's mostly about people talking into a cinematic masterpiece. Although it's not without its faults, but it's the most technically proficient film on this list. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is the film that brings Nolan an Oscar. Reportedly, there was no use of CGI and the movie was entirely shot on film with the highest definition available. In addition to the quality of the film's look, the star-studded cast delivers with performances that add nuance. Killian Murphy is at the top of his game, showing us both the obsessive scientific side of Oppenheimer as he and his team proudly pushes the boundaries of science, and the man that's haunted by the loss of life that such an advancement can cause. It's a complicated emotion that transcends the screen and can leave you feeling both in awe and sick to your stomach. Number 2 can actually be compared to Monster. As it's also a search for the truth, but here it's not about how the truth can get muddled, it's about the incredible difficulty to sift through it. Samuel had no enemies that Stop, make... stop. I did not kill him. That's not the point. Anatomy of a Fall has a very simple question to be answered. Did the main character push her husband out of a window and to his death? 
The rest of the movie is the arduous task of putting all the clues together and having them dissected in a fascinating clash of words and language. It's a mostly French procedural, which opened my eyes as to how in French courts you don't have someone shouting objections like you would in a North American court drama. Here the prosecutor, the defendant, and the judge discuss things as a free-flow conversation where anyone can just interject. Getting to the truth is shown to be as difficult as building a puzzle while using pieces from other puzzles to help recreate what the real image could look like. Pulling different intimate events from the main character's life, the time she cheated on her spouse, a recording of a fight they had together, unearthing the most personal details that are true but not indicative of the whole truth. All of this to make a point that the truth is what we ultimately decide, not necessarily what can be proven. And now, before we get to our number one, I will add a bonus entry, an anti-recommendation. I want to mention the movie that I felt was the biggest waste of our time. The Exorcist Believers. Or Believer. I'm not gonna check. I went in willfully blind with non-existent expectations hoping for something just adequate and still felt disappointed. The start was good though, but it quickly became an escalating misunderstanding of what made the original a classic. I don't go out of my way to watch bad movies, but what a complete waste of effort, resources, actors, and IP. And in this economy? So now it's finally time for number one. It's just one of those movies where you have no idea what's going to happen next, which is indicative of all Yorgos Lantimos films. You will ask yourself, what the hell is going on? Why did they do that? Why are they still doing that? A director with whom I'm not on the same wavelength with, but I can appreciate his oddity and his penchant for the beautifully grotesque. Number one on this list is Poor Things. The fable of a she Frankenstein's monster's journey and exploration of her womanhood as she encounters the pitfalls, pleasures, and expectations that surround it. Emma Stone gave her everything for this role. And I mean everything. Mark Ruffalo made a clear rejection of any pre-Marvel or current Marvel typecast expectations of him and a true highlight performance of the year. Yorgos has come a long way from his start in the quirky but disturbing Dogtooth, showing that he has not found restraint for his audacity, but refinement in the way of presenting his strange stories, doubling down on past experimentation, the deforming of the frames, the play with colors, textures, silhouettes, and lavish extravagant sets, forming an off-kilter elseworld that just slightly resembles our own, but it's definitely of Yorgos' creation. It's decadent, it's a bit much, it takes many technical swings, but it's able to evoke disgust, laughter, and curiosity all in the same frame. And for that, here at Screened, we feel this deserved our number one pick of the year. So, what were your favorite movies of 2023? Did anyone really like the Exorcist movie? Thanks again for watching our video. See you next time, please feel free to feed the algorithm gods and subscribe to our ramblings.